Monday night chat with Wong Chen. Brought to you by the Member of Parliament for Subang. Hi, welcome to Monday Night Chat. This is episode 7, if I'm correct. Uh, my staff tells me that I look refreshed. That's because I've been taking a bit of a holiday time for myself. I had three days in Balik Pulau in Penang with my family. You know, the kids have been uh, on school holiday, so it's, it's been a long time since they actually had a, had a short trip with us. So uh, that was a short three-day holiday for myself. And then I had to go over the weekend to my school reunion, my 30th year school reunion in Singapore in United World College. So that was a lot of fun. So therefore, I look a bit more refreshed this week. This week, we only have two segments, the uh, Policy Monday segment and 120 seconds of Q&A. Policy Monday this week is going to take a different topic. We're going to talk about BRIM, the pros and cons of BRIM. Uh, you know, this is an emotional topic, I think, for many of us. Uh, I did promise to talk about other things this week, but you know, the BRIM, BRIM, BRIM story is just too big. So we're going to start by explaining what BRIM really is. BRIM started in 2012 uh, with a budget towards, the, towards 2018. The budget became 6.8 billion ringgit. Uh, it's a, basically a cash handout, unconditional cash handout, 6.8 billion, and the re total recipient was 7.2 million recipients. Some of them family, some of them individual. Uh, if you're earning below 3,000, you get basically 1,200 a month. So basically, you know, 100 ringgit a month for your family. If you're earning between 3,000 to 4,000, you're going to get about 900 ringgit a, uh, a year. Yeah, And then uh, for individuals earning less than... Uh, 2,000 a month, they get 450 ringgit of BRIM support. So as I said, the total payout was 6.8 billion, the total number of recipient was 7.2 million. Uh, you know, so the question is, uh, what was the official position of Pakatan Harapan? Pakatan Harapan in our manifesto states clearly that we will maintain BRIM but try to change it to make it more conditional and limit the amount of, uh, the, the amount of things that they can buy. For instance, we will make it conditional to sending your kids to school, conditional for you to get a job, or at least attempt to get a job for more than six months before you can get BRIM. Yeah? So we need positive reinforcement or positive contribution from the BRIM recipient in order for them to receive this aid. Second is, you know, we thought that this BRIM money is so hard to come by when it's given. You shouldn't go and buy alcohol, you shouldn't go and buy tobacco. You should spend it on the children, you should spend it on education. Yeah? So that is the Pakatan Harapan position. And as early as May 17, uh, Dr. Mahdi was quoted. This is a week after we won. And this was what he was quoted to say. Uh, we cannot see BRIM as a form of bribery to support the government. Instead, it should be viewed as a driver to tackle social uh, problems. I think that was the position of the um, of Pakatan Harapan one week into government. And I think it's the absolutely correct position and consistent with the manifesto. But, you know, as you know, last week, the Prime Minister uh, voiced his concerns about BRIM and said that it will be eliminated uh, in on a scheduled basis or timetable basis. We're not sure what the terms are. But this is what, uh, you know, BRIM will fall under Azmin Ali, and this is what Azmin Ali had to say on the 26th of August. PM is right. This is because the cash aid has a corruption element in getting uh, support from the people. So basically, uh, uh, an almost 180 U-turn uh, on the issue. So BRIM is now seen as a corrupting factor. Now, is BRIM corrupt or not corrupt? What is the big public policy issue on this? Now, let me say this. Yeah? Like any public policy, there are pros and cons. A cash handout is considered today in international standard to be a good thing. Yeah? Because cash handouts do not require a complicated system of administration. Yeah? So if you want to give 100 ringgit, the cost of giving this 100 ringgit might be like this 2 ringgit. So 98 ringgit or 98 percent of the contribution goes back to the people that need it the most if you run a program an empowerment program affirmative action program the cost of running this can easily reach 20 to 30 percent so for every hundred dollar of contribution you give only 70 dollars actually receive the recipient in need 
Yeah. So this, that is the wonderful thing, the pro of having a unconditional cash transfer. Okay. Now the cons is this. Of course, I think this is where Dr. Mahdi is coming from. He's an old school politician. He's after all 93 years old. So he believes that you must work for things. You shouldn't get anything free. No free handout. Work for it. You want to make money, you work. Yeah, I, I think I can understand that. I, I think most of the older generation can uh, believe in that kind of thing. But then again, we have to look in the context of today. In the 1980s, 1990s, when Mahdi was first term prime minister, um, it was a roaring time. Of course, everybody can get a job. Inequality wasn't that wide. There was opportunity to make a lot of money. There's opportunity for even the poorest people, if they need to work hard, that they can do it. But today, in 2018, since the 2008 crash, global problem is high level of inequality, right? Uh, you know, the entrenchment of corporate interests, the, the, the creation of tech billionaires, multi-billionaires. The world today is very different from the 1980s and 1990s. And in reaction to this, the World Bank and IMF, the great cheerleaders of, uh, you know, of uh, hyper-capitalism, are now all in favor of some sort of cash transfer. Yeah? And in the Malaysian context, let's look at it properly. You have 14, 15 million people working, right? Of which only 15% make enough money to pay some income tax. That means 85% of the working population do need help. You can't survive on 3,000 ringgit a month for a family in Kuala Lumpur. You just can't. I think you'll struggle even to survive in a semi-urban, semi-rural area. So therefore, you know, when we, when we want to look at policy, please don't take an ideological position. Look at the data and see what are the patterns emerging. That 100 ringgit a month that we give to a poor family earning below 3,000 a month, what is it being spent for? Are these people taking the 100 ringgit to buy, you know, five cartons of cigarettes? Or are they actually feeding the children better? A study that narrows down to how brain money is used is essential to, dis to, 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 to make a final decision whether brain should be continued or discontinued. Again, we can put in conditions. You can say conditions you cannot buy certain things. Conditions you must do something positive in return for this. So I would think that this matter is not over yet. Uh, a lot of uh, members of parliament have voiced concerns about this because one, it's not exactly as per our manifesto. Second, the environment for this requires a full study, a full scale study before you make any decision because the brain impact is positive to the poorest people. Uh, whether it is good ideologically or good policy in the longer term, who knows? And the only way we can know this is to see the pattern on spending from the brim money. If it is spent on children's education, is spent on children's food, then we must continue. If it's wrongly spent, then maybe Dr. Made has, uh, has some justification to stop brim over a period of time. That's it for this week on Policy Monday. Hi, for Q&A this week, I'm uh, assisted by Max. Uh, we've got about five questions as usual. So Max, we're going to start now. Can you just press the button? Okay, first, the China deal, the cancellation of the two pipelines and also the ECRL is a necessity for us because there were no economic multiplier. The price was too high. The real issue going forward is this. The cancellation has been done. What will China react reaction be? So far, Global Times, the mouthpiece of the Chinese government, it's been quite uh, moderate. They say they understand Malaysia's position, but in the coming months, we have to see whether really China is going to take any punitive action or not, whether some sort of repayment compensation needs to be done, and what will happen to the oil palm trade. Whatever it is, we have to prepare for any uh, negative reaction and try to re-engage China on the issue. Number two, uh, another 16 billion uh, unreturned income tax refund. Guan has raised this issue in addition to the GST 19 billion. This is a very serious matter. Uh, if money has been misplaced, misused or whatever reason, I think there is a call now for have a parliamentary uh, committee on basically fiscal policy, yeah? revenue and expenditure. That needs to come in as soon as possible. Number three, uh, the SST list is not complete yet. That is worrying because on the 1st September, in a few days time, we are going to start the uh, the SST regime, 
So the very least the government can do now and must do is to give some sort of grace period for the consumers and also the um, the manufacturers to adjust to. Okay, number five CEP ex and number four CEP extension. I'm totally against it. I don't think it's proper that with a full cabinet, with ministers and parliamentarians, that we need external advisors uh, to continue this thing. If they need to do it. Then I want Mahdi, Dr. Mahdi to come to and justify to Parliament in October why the extension is needed. Number six, the AES 450 million waiver. Uh, you know, if you speed, you pay. La. That's my position. But I, sh I don't think we should have waived it because that 450 million can be used to build a hospital. That's it for Q&A this week.